Greetings, my name is Michael Levine and I have had a very unexpected life in many ways and one of the ways that my life has been most unexpected is that I've had the privilege of knowing the most fascinating people. Many, many, many fascinating people, but none more fascinating than That's our guests. That's what he says every time. <laughs> They're all no, fascinating. I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you you're fascinating. Well, that may be, but I'm going to tell you why I think you're fascinating. Oh, good. This will because be good. our guest, Susan Estridge, is, among many things, the first woman to ever run a national presidential campaign. She's an author. She's brilliant. But what makes her fascinating to me is that with all her brilliance, her greatness, she has found a way somehow, which we're gonna talk about in great depth, I hope, in great detail, to remain vulnerable, <laughs> authentic, and transparent as a human being. Many of the fascinating people who I've known I and who- Don't, they read their own publicity, <laughs> right? They listen to their own yes people, That's right? true. That you and true. I don't do that. Well, well we, we have know. also found a way of telling people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear, but Speaking anyway. Speaking truth to power, I was talking, talking to somebody- Talking truth to power. I was saying that's why campaigns shouldn't be run by 35-year-olds. I was reminiscing with a guy who's writing a book about the 1988 campaign. And that was the summer Michael Dukakis, as you remember, went back to Massachusetts and wouldn't leave. And I was his loyal campaign manager, and I'd get out there every day and say, well, we've got judges to pick, the budget to do. And I realized many years later that if I'd been old enough, and I had a candidate who was the Democratic nominee for president who was going back to the state house and wasn't going to campaign for the summer. I probably should have called up the vice presidential nominee and the chair of the party and got my senior staff together and gotten everybody to walk up to the state house and say, we're all out of there. Unless Created you leave. An intervention. Right. But at 35, you're loyal. Mm -hmm. At 50, you figure out that you need to tell the truth. But anyway, you and I tell no, truth you to know, power. Uh, yeah, and, and as I think truth and to that's power. that's why, you know, we're still working for a living, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> Susan Estrich, I'm so honored to be talking to you, and I want to start the journey by talking about how it began for you. Where were you born? How was your life? How did your life unfold? I was born, I was explaining this to somebody today. I was born in the same town as Leslie Stahl, but 11 from years later. From 60 Minutes. Leslie. From 60 Minutes on the same day, in the same hospital, in the same town, but I'm 11 years younger. So as long as she's still looking good. But <laughs> you're fine. I'm okay. You're fine. I got another 11 years. Okay, so I'm from fine. Massachusetts. Right. And I'm just like everybody else. But were you, when you were raised in, in, your, in your hometown, and I, if I had met you in high school, would you have appeared to me to have come from a middle class home? Middle upper class. Middle, a middle class I would, home. I was a Peter Pot waitress beginning at the age of 15. I've worked since I was 15 years old. 15 years when old. people say they're going on a month's vacation, I say, what is a month's vacation? <laughs> is that an entire consecutive month where you don't work? Yeah, yeah. I've never had one of those in my right, life. Right, right. Um, no, I've been working since I was 15. I've been on my own. Middle since. class family. Yes. Brothers and sisters? I have an older sister and a younger brother, but I was labeled the smart one. Mm -hmm. My sister was going to be the pretty one. My brother was, I don't know, he was the boy one. I was the smart one. Naturally good student? Oh, I don't know if I was naturally good, but or I just that worked in, 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 in the 60s. I don't know about your family, but I think parents read in the book that each kid was supposed to have their niche. Mm -hmm. So my sister was the artistic, one. I was dramatic. My sister was dating and had boyfriends. I had book reports. Mm -hmm. I was the one who saw my ticket, and everybody figures their own ticket, but I figured my ticket was, you know, I learned to twirl a baton and do splits in the mud, but my ticket was never going to be the Olympics, all right? My ticket was being smart. But you taught me something you don't even realize many years ago, and this is what you taught me. You know, Michael, we all get cards in life. Some of us get bad cards and play them well. Right. Some of us get good, good cards, cards and, and play, play them bad. poorly. Right? But how do you play your cards? Is how you play the cards you dealt. And mine was sort of a mixed hand. Mm -hmm. 
I applied to, I tell this to students because I think it's important. People never tell these stories. I always like to tell stories of failure. So I worked really hard in high school and I got all A's, but I went to a public high school and I didn't get all 800s. I didn't have SAT tutors and all of that. So I applied to, I think, five colleges. Four of them were co-ed. And one, my mother said, I'll type for you. It's an all-women's college. It was Wellesley. Wellesley. I got rejected at all the co-ed colleges. I got into Wellesley. They gave me a scholarship. My parents said, well. I guess we know where you're I going. I guess we know where you're going. And that's where I went. Um, and I'm a real lemonade person. I'm one of those people who believes that you take lemons and you better make them into lemonade because what else are you going to do with them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my first major lemonade stand grew out of being raped when I was about 20 years old. I was finishing college early because mm -hmm. I needed money and I was working two jobs. And going to college and working two jobs. Yeah, well, right. And so then... I was driving home from graduation rehearsal to my apartment, and I um, was pulling into my parking space. It was broad daylight. And a guy came up to my car with a nice pick and said, push over, shut up, or I'll kill you. And the immediate reaction of people was, don't tell anyone. My mother said, don't tell anybody. No man will ever have you. You know, the police said to me, are you sure you want to go through with making a complaint here? You seem like a very nice girl. I was going to Harvard Law School that fall. I was determined. And as it happened, the guy was never found. So anyway, I went to Harvard Law School that fall. How'd you get into Harvard Law School? Oh, I had perfect grades at Wellesley. Mm -hmm. And this time, I knew how to take those but the boards. Were the perfect grades really a result of tireless effort? They were a result of pretty much effort. I've always worked hard. I mean, I'm not one of those people who says, well, I'll just, I just sit there and A pluses come to me like birds. No, you work hard. So you I've never gotten anything. So I went to Harvard Law School and I realized nobody ever taught rape. And I raised my hand to talk about it in one class and the professor didn't call on me and we went to see him afterwards. But I decided that I was going to do something about the problem of rape in America. And I have, over the last... 35 years, that's been one of the areas where as an academic I focused a lot of my scholarship and activism and volunteer work, which is to stand up for women who are victims of sexual assault. So that was one of my first lemonade stands. But anyway, I went from Wellesley to Harvard Law School, and when I was at Harvard Law School, I did very well. That was when I a lot of tough things were going on in my life. My parents had gotten divorced, and my sister Which is was... A, at a time when people didn't get No, divorced. yeah, it was the 70s, was, things were getting bad, right? You know, my father left. And so I made the law review. She really? made the Harvard, Harvard law, law review. review. Right, and initially wow. I was, there were 20 of us, and I was the only girl. And it's funny, my daughter called me up not long ago and said, you know, it's a patriarchy out there. I started to laugh. I patriarchy thought, now? No, I thought, oh, my goodness. Well, and of course it is. The idea that we changed it in a generation is ludicrous. But I felt like but saying... But it's good you, now. But you have, you know, the fact that you could be as old as you are, I think she's 27, and not have realized this is only a reflection of how much we changed. At least we got equality at the bottom. But yeah, no, there was no question it was a patriarchy. I was the only girl. Um, later on, one other girl joined. And I had the audacity or the determination or whatever you call it. I worked incredibly hard. But when it came time in February to decide who was going to run for president, I raised my hand. And I ran against five guys. And the joke of the story is that each of us was assigned a third year student to be our advocate. And I was sure Merrick Garland, who almost got on the Supreme Court, was going to win because he was assigned like one of the most popular guys on he the Law Review. He was the nominee for uh, Barack Obama's last nominee. Right. I, on the other hand, was assigned this guy who was working at a law firm in New York five days a week and was never around and was already married and had a child. And his name was John Quinn, who is now <laughs> my 
law partner who went on to form a law firm, found a law firm that now has 700 lawyers. And about 10 years ago, when I decided it was time to practice law, I called John Quinn and now I practice law. But he was my advocate. And as he likes to tell clients, as it happens, no litigation was required. We just won in one day. So, so once I was president of the Harvard Law Review, that so was a big deal. I won. You won. In the and most I was audacious. the first woman president of the Harvard Law Review, the first black president, you know, outdid me by quite a bit. Well, that's Barack Obama. Correct. Right. So, well, yeah. I was telling you about this conversation I saw right, on TV right. last time. So, so I was the first woman president of the Law Review, and I was on national television, and people asked me if I was going to put recent recipes in the Law Review and whether I'd made it from affirmative action. And I said, no, actually, I made it from hard work. And from there, my path was a little bit easier.